Happening now, health leaders in Chautauqua County are looking to schools and kicking off their efforts to vaccinate youth against COVID-19. Details coming up. Plus, find out why members of the LGBTQ plus community at SUNY JCC are holding a protest against a former senator's speech this week. Well, it's another day of sunshine and we're going to see some clouds filtering in for the afternoon. But how long is this wonderful weather going to last? I'll talk about it next as the news at noon starts now. Live and on demand, this is WNY News Now. Health leaders in Chautauqua County are looking to schools and kicking off their efforts to vaccinate youth against COVID-19. Thanks for joining us for WNY News Now. I'm Justin Gould. This after New York's Vaccine Advisory Task Force recommended approving Pfizer's vaccine for children between the ages of 12 and 15 late yesterday. The state's governor then quickly approved authorization for that following the announcement. Chautauqua County's health director, Christine Schuyler, tells WNY News Now there are several options for getting the age group immunized ranging from the already ongoing county vaccine sites to local schools as well. She says parents don't have to be present for the vaccination. However, the youth must be accompanied by an adult and have a note authorizing consent. In the next week, the health director will be working with local districts and setting up clinics directly at school buildings, but says if parents show interest, they can start the process now. If parents do have an interest, in advocating for their school to have an on-site vaccination clinic, I think it would probably be best for them to contact school administration uh, and suggest that to them. Uh, we are working with the school superintendents and the school nurses uh, in setting up plans for on-site clinics. Uh, we've had a few already that were, that were well attended. CVS and Walgreen pharmacies are among sites where children 12 to 15 can start getting vaccinated here locally. To learn more about vaccine availability, visit chqgov.com. Well, with the go-ahead to vaccinate kids 12 to 15 years old against COVID, many education leaders say it's one more weapon in the fight to get them back to full-time in-person learning as soon as possible. Britt Conway reports on the reopening plans that are in the works. And you can relax, it's okay. And the CDC gave Pfizer the okay too on giving its vaccine to kids 12 to 15 years old. Like 14 year old Graham Peisner, he has big plans. Uh, like hang out with some friends and go buy some Microsoft products. As for school. I'm pretty sure in the fall I'll be going back in person in school. That's exactly what Education Secretary Miguel Cardona wants to see too. There's no reason to wait any longer. But it's a work in progress. Take a look at this map from Education Week tracking each state's mandates. As of Wednesday, 12 states are fully open in dark blue. In two states, it depends on the grade. That's in light blue. Red means partial closure. Two states plus D.C. and Puerto Rico. But the rest of the country is in gold which means there's no statewide order in effect. So it's up to the district or even school to decide. Every day that passes is a wasted opportunity. Now that kids 12 to 15 can get vaccinated, Cardona says it's time. Even two to three weeks being with your classmates, being with your teacher, uh, help students be prepared. Though even he said two weeks ago, some schools face legitimate challenges in reopening, like outdated buildings with old ventilation systems, reduced capacity on buses, and community spread of COVID-19. But he says help is here. This is about getting students into school. We'll see you in three weeks. I'm Britt Conway reporting. Britt, thank you. Well, members of the LGBTQ plus community at SUNY JCC here in Jamestown will be holding a protest in the wake of a decision by the college to feature former state senator Catherine Young as its keynote speaker for a virtual commencement ceremony on Friday evening. Dr. Greg Rabb telling WNY News Now that he is currently organizing a last minute protest that will happen at 6 o'clock Friday at the flagpole located by the campus pond. Around that time, the ceremony is scheduled to take place virtually. Rab, an openly gay facility member, a faculty member, spoke during a Jamestown Pride meeting this week, saying that the decision to host Young is something he is 
uh, against, adding that Young has a track record of voting against the LGBTQ plus community. And we find that completely unacceptable. And the president said he's not going to pull it back. We have protested again. Uh, and now you've got a, the colleges in turmoil. If you if if we're about pride, we got to do more than just have a you know party. Yeah. I would ask you to call the president's office tomorrow and tell him to remove Senator Young as the virtual commencement speaker because yeah. it's it's hurting and killing the college. I have LGBTQ students who are in pain. Reb says that those on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force will not be attending any events that SUNY JCC will officially be involved with unless it's removed from the pro, pro unless Young is removed from the program. Rab telling us this morning that he's still trying to get DeMarte to remove Young as the speaker. He's urging people to call his office now. In a statement provided by the school's uh, president's office saying that the college is hoping to build dialogue between Young and the LGBTQ plus community. We'll, of course, continue to follow this and provide updates online at WNYNewsNow.com. Well, the Buffalo Bills 2021 NFL season schedule was released yesterday, and after the season's run to the AFC Championship game last year, the team was rewarded with four primetime appearances. The Bills are scheduled to play on Monday Night Football twice and Sunday Night Football once. They'll also head to New Orleans for Thanksgiving night's game against the Saints. Now, only one of the primetime games is at home as the Bills will host the Patriots on Monday, December 6th. The Bills will travel to Kansas City and Tennessee for Sunday Night Football and Monday Night Football in consecutive weeks on October 10th and 18th. The team's home opener will be Sunday, September 12th against the Steelers. The team currently has nine home games. The full lineup posted now at buffalobills.com forward slash schedule. Certainly exciting for a lot of Bills fans out there. Let us know what you think about the, these stories and more in the comments down below. Uh, good to see uh, Becky. Good to see uh, Tasha, Lisa. Uh, good to see uh, Jose and uh, Joe as well. Hopefully you are all having a great day. We appreciate you tuning in. And... Uh, to answer uh, Tasha's question, uh, the LGBTQ plus community at SUNY JCC uh, gathering tomorrow for a protest against Senator Young's virtual appearance as the commencement speaker. Uh, we plan to have uh, reporters at that protest and we'll continue to provide updates on this story as we can. Uh, well, now let's get to our first check of our weather forecast. Chief Forecaster Dakota Hunter live with that. Happy Thursday, sir. Hey, happy Thursday, everybody. So close to another weekend, and man, it is a gorgeous day out there. Look at Salamanca. These are, once again, fair weather, cumulus clouds. Same thing we talked about yesterday. They're back once again. They develop a look at this temperature of 60 degrees in the dew point, relatively low at 29 in Salamanca. So that's going to become your fair weather pal, that high pressure that's in control across the northeast. There you see the clouds starting to bubble up across the southern tier from north to south going into northwestern Pennsylvania. And again, these are fair weather clouds, so no rain is going to be falling out of them. That's the good news. So it's going to be another day of sunshine, which will then become filtered with a little bit of uh, cloud cover later in the afternoon. 30 was the peak wind gush yesterday at the airport. So man, it was a breezy day yesterday. Dunkirk at only 18. So the southern tier right down near the state line actually saw some of the stronger winds yesterday. And those were a west to northwest wind. 56 was the high yesterday. We started the day at 35. Some spots had frost this morning. I can say we're done with that for a little while. 88 and 24 are the record highs and lows for today. So through the afternoon, just another great day of sunshine. A few more clouds filter in later in the afternoon, milder than where it has been. 57 to 65 with that west wind, uh, which is ultimately going to keep the Lake Erie shoreline cooler today. Now we do see a little bit of more sunshine in the way. Plus, do we see any rain in the forecast? I'll tell you about it in just a few, Justin. All right, Dakota, we'll be looking forward to that coming up in about uh, 10 minutes time here. Well, there's a new push to make free school lunches in the United States permanent. New York Senator Christian Gillibrand says that free food has helped bridge a nutritional gap during the pandemic. Right now, free breakfast and lunch is available nationwide through the 2021-22 school year. She says making universal school meals permanent would benefit families as well as school districts. She says students would feel less isolated in schools would also see help with costs in the end. 
We've also seen that when pandemic EBT um, and the school lunch program was made um, universal under um, COVID, that it streamlined costs for a lot of schools. The senator says farmers also benefit from the inclusion of locally grown foods. Well, as gas prices climb in some areas of the nation, a group of liberal lawmakers here in New York are pushing a bill to get more electric vehicles on the roadways. New York State Capital Correspondent Karina Capabianca reports on the effort to make it easier for customers to buy those vehicles. Allowing zero emission vehicle manufacturers to have direct sales will exponentially increase the amount of zero emission vehicles on the road. Senate sponsor Todd Kaminsky says his bill will make it easier for customers to have access to electric vehicles across the state. Currently, there is a cap on direct sales locations for EVs. Assembly member Pat Fahey's office says California has nearly 700,000 zero emission vehicles on the road. New York, by contrast, has less than 70,000. For us not to even be in the top 10 of ownership is just. It's, it's almost inex, inexplicable. How can Oklahoma, Iowa, other states beat us on EV uh, ownership? She says more zero emission dealerships are especially needed upstate. Senator Pete Harcum is also sponsoring a bill that has passed the legislature and would require all new car sales to be zero emissions by 2035. How can we do that? if we have a prohibition on the direct sales of electric vehicles here in New York. And that's where this bill comes into play. As Democrats push for more options to purchase electric vehicles, Republicans are calling on the governor to suspend the gas tax following the shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline, resulting from a ransomware attack. In Albany, Karina Capabianca. Karina, thank you. Next, a Jamestown man facing federal drug, drug charges in connection with allegedly selling meth here in Jamestown. And later, officials continue their talks about the potential controlled deer hunt that could get underway here in the city. Stay with us as WNY News Now continues. Coverage that matters. This is WNY News Now. The George Barone Jr. Scholarship Fund is hosting its first annual rummage and bag sale fundraiser. An inductee in the Chautauqua Sports Hall of Fame, Barone managed, coached, and assisted in youth baseball for 64 years in and around the Jamestown area. 100% of proceeds generated will be donated, which will provide scholarships to graduating Southwestern Central School seniors who partake in athletics. Learn more by checking out the scholarship on Facebook and joining us for the fundraising event. EagleZip.com is your local one-stop shop for all of your home and business computer needs. Located on Fluvan Avenue Extension, just outside of Jamestown, EagleZip.com sells and services all brands of desktops and laptops, as well as servers and network equipment for your business. All new computer sales include transferring your data from your old computer, plus a two-year warranty. Call EagleZip.com today. Stop by EagleZip.com today and let us make computers easy for you. Honest John says what you're looking for When you want it good, we're gonna give you lots more from freshly made subs to the best of pizza and wings, Honest John's has what you're looking for. And now two great locations, East 2nd Street and Fairmount Avenue. Order takeout or delivery today online at honestjohns.pizza. You're gonna get it good at Honest John's. There's an old saying, there's no news in the newsroom. Well. It's true. The time I spend at the anchor desk is just part of my day. Most of our time is spent gathering stories in the community. Stories that matter to you. We can't do it alone, and we need your help. When you see breaking news or have a news tip we should know about, drop us a line on Facebook today. Email our news desk or call our newsroom at 488-7226 so we can bring those stories straight back to you. 
You're watching WNY News Now, where coverage comes first. A 28-year-old man has been indicted for allegedly selling methamphetamine with his girlfriend in the Jamestown area last year. The U.S. Attorney's Office says June Martinez is facing multiple drug trafficking charges following an investigation. Prosecutors say Martinez was arrested with his girlfriend, co-defendant Anastasia Babcock, last October after the Jamestown Metro Drug Task Force raided their Westcutt Street home Inside that house, law enforcement officers say they see just one pound of meth, drug paraphernalia, and around $62,000 in cash. The charges carry a mandatory minimum penalty of 10 years in prison, a maximum of life, and a $10 million fine. Well, for some time, members of Jamestown City Council have discussed ways in which to conduct a controlled deer hunt within city limits. Well, some of those members have opposed the idea due to several potential safety and liability issues they see there. Councilman Tom Nelson of Ward 6 and other members of this Deer Management Committee met last night, and they're continuing to push for a controlled bow hunt. Bob Johnson, who was one involved with the Christian Bow Hunters of America for several years, spoke at the committee meeting. He says that any hunter selected by the city for a controlled hunt would have extensive training in the subject. The biggest test is, I don't think we have anybody that's interested that's not a conscientious hunter, that knows what the proper angle to execute a shot is, what, what is the proper place to put an arrow, and when is it not property and release an arrow. For example, you can't shoot a deer with a bow that's looking at you. There's no place you can carve a said animal humanely. Jamestown Police Chief Tim Jackson also attended that meeting, saying while he agrees that there is a deer problem, he doesn't believe a controlled hunt is the best solution. Council President Tony Dulce and fellow Councilman Brent Sheldon say the committee needs to construct a firm plan before presenting it to the entire lawmaking body. Well, President Biden met with Republican and Democratic leaders at the White House yesterday, saying he's a bit optimistic the two sides can compromise and reach a deal on his infrastructure proposal, but it appears they still can't even agree on what infrastructure includes or how to pay for it. Caitlin Collins reports. It was an Oval okay. Office sit-down that lasted 90 minutes. I came away uh, encouraged. President Biden meeting with both leaders from both parties for the first time. I'm encouraged that there is room to have a compromise on a bipartisan bill that's solid and significant. The president emphasizing the need to compromise on an infrastructure bill, but whether they will is still a big if. How do you expect to do that, sir? How do you expect to come Easy, to Easy, just snap my fingers, it'll happen. Right now, Republicans and Democrats don't even agree on what counts as infrastructure. I think the first step is obviously to define what infrastructure is. Let's agree on what we're trying to achieve, and then we can talk about how we pay for it. And they definitely haven't agreed on how to do that. We're not interested in reopening the 2017 tax bill. We both made that clear to the president. That's our red line. So raising taxes would be the biggest mistake you could make. Pelosi countering the GOP red line with this. I myself think that what the Republicans did on the tax scam to give 83 percent of the benefits to the top one percent was a big rip. The big issue looming over the meeting wasn't bridges or roads or broadband, but a big election lie and those who stood by the former president as he promoted it. I don't think anybody is questioning the legitimacy of the presidential election. I think that is all over with. We're sitting here with the president today. Asked if he can work with McCarthy despite their differences, Biden signaled yes. Can you trust him and work with him? Thank you, yes. This was the first time the four congressional leaders were all at the White House since this showdown in 2019, when Pelosi was seen pointing her finger at Trump during a heated talk about U.S. troops in Syria. Tomorrow, Biden meets with the Republican senators who have countered his $2.3 trillion infrastructure offer with a $568 billion alternative. There's going to be a meeting tomorrow with Senator Capito and a number of Republican senators to discuss exactly that, where we can find some common ground. Caitlin Collins reporting. The Biden administration says it wants to see major progress on infrastructure legislation by Memorial Day. 
Well, the Colonial Gasoline Pipeline is flowing once again after a ransomware attack shut it down for six days. That's good news for the southeastern U.S. where many gas stations are completely dry and price gouging is rampant. Nervous motorists have hoarded so much gas, more than 70% of stations in North Carolina are completely out. The situation is only slightly better in neighboring states like Virginia and Georgia. Energy Secretary Jennifer Grantham says things should get back to normal by the weekend. That may be a little optimistic, though. Just do some quick math here. The Colonial Pipeline is 5,500 miles long, and gas flows through it at a rate of 5 miles per hour. So, experts say panic buying and a shortage of truck drivers to deliver gas by uh, road complicates matters to create the situation. Hmm. Well, hopefully we can get things moving again. Good that they're back up online. Let us know what you think about these stories and more in the comments down below. Uh, it's uh, great to see Pam. Good to see Andrew, Cassie, and uh, Ron as well. Hopefully you all are having a great day. Let us know uh, what you guys are doing, what you guys are up to. Send us a... A thumb, if you want, <laughs> to say hello uh, in the uh, comments. Uh, well, let's uh, get to Dakota's full forecast now. And uh, a lot of people out there are ready for spring, I think, Dakota. And I hope you can uh, deliver that, maybe? Yes, I mean, you know, spring is around for now. And I think as we get uh, throughout the week into the next week, spring really is going to get going here. Let's take a look at it. And uh, wanted to mention, first of all, where the temperatures are going over the next five days. It's like a turtle-like improvement over the next five days. Temperatures are slowly creeping up here. And uh, by the time we head into next week, we're going to be ultimately right around that 69 degree mark, getting close to 70 by next week. So if you think it's weird to be cold around here in May, Think again, let's look at last year. Now the average high for the month going from May 1st through the 15th, right through the middle of the month was 44 degrees. Now compare that to the last leg of the month where it really significantly warmed up and the average high through the 16th through the 31st was 65. So it was complete whiplash. We were thrown all over the place from chilly to warm, chilly to warm. And then at the end of the month, temperatures just soared right up. And some signs indicate we might see a repeat of last May, where we may see some big time surge of warm air coming in by the end of the month. And speaking about the end of the month, it looks like a dry pattern. And remember, this is still not good news as some areas still need the rainfall around here. So not a whole lot of rain coming toward the middle or end of the month. This is a, a below average chance for rainfall here. This uh, darker teal color here, this uh, teal, this tan uh, color is more of the uh, what uh, ultimately shows you below average for rainfall. So the radar right now shows you there are those little cumulus clouds starting to bubble up, but high pressure firmly in control back to our north and west. And that little guy is going to be your fair weather pal through the next couple of days. Look at the clouds downtown. This is fair weather cumulus clouds. So this is what it's supposed to look like around here this time of the year. 59 right now with a north wind of 8. And we don't have a wind chill index when the temperature is up there and obviously with a light wind. So here we go. The future scan paints those uh, clouds around. Tries to bring in a little bit of moisture for the eastern southern tier. Don't buy that. I don't think there's going to be any rain today. Air is just too dry to allow that to happen. Tonight, mainly clear. Starlit skies get out and stargaze. Fantastic night for that. Tomorrow, basically a repeat, a good amount of sunshine and temperatures, as you saw, budging up a little bit, a little bit each more day. So here's old Metrocast for you. 64 by 2 o'clock this afternoon. A great afternoon. 62 at 6 by the time you settle down at dinner and by the time you get ready to tuck yourself into bed at 10 o'clock, 50 degrees with lots of clear sky. How about the future? Next seven days coming up right now. 57 tomorrow, uh, 65 tomorrow. Sun continues. Also the same for Saturday and Sunday. The weekend, great. A small chance for a rain shower both Monday and Tuesday, but I don't think you should worry about that. Just a chance for a spot of your isolated shower. And then the sun returns on Wednesday. Look at those temperatures, lower 70s. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Coverage that matters. This is WNY News Now. You're watching WNY News Now, your source for breaking news. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. Testicular cancer is the leading form of cancer in men aged 15 to 35. 
One in 250 men will be diagnosed with testicular cancer. But 98% will survive if detected early. As a survivor, I believe early detection is the key. Learn how to do a testicular self-exam and other important facts about testicular cancer at oneball4tc.com. Slow down. Slow down and move over. Move over. When you see signs, lights, vests, please give us some room. Slow down. Slow down and move over. When you need help, it's our job to help you. To save you. Despite the danger. This danger. This danger is real. Do your part. Please. Slow down. Slow down. And move over. Move over. With coverage that matters. This is WNY News Now. Public beaches and pools in New York will reopen just in time for Memorial Day. That's the word from Governor Andrew Cuomo, who announced the news during a briefing in Buffalo. He says six feet of social distancing will be required, adding that as COVID-19 numbers trend in the right direction, more venues will be able to open up. If the numbers keep going the way they're going, we're going to be able to do that. So uh, we would actually be able to have a normal summer, uh, finally, in uh, beaches and pools, and that's what we're striving for. The governor says the state's COVID-19 hospitalization numbers are the best since November, with seven-day average infection rates continuing to decline. He says if that data improves, the beaches and pools specifically could be at full capacity by the 4th of July. Well, let's hope so. Well, we thank you for joining us for WNY News. And now on this Thursday out there, let's uh, bring back Dakota here. We'll talk about beaches and pools and all things nice. And, you know, I think the one thing we, we reflecting on it today, when you look at COVID and the last year and some change that we've been through, specifically last year at this time, start of May, I think people were hopeful that we'd come to some sort of closure. That didn't exactly happen, and still even today, we still have so much uncertainty. But I think finally, looking at the hospitalizations and the numbers, and really that's what we were afraid of in the beginning, right, is what health officials mm -hmm. said, is they didn't want to overwhelm the hospitals. Well, we're not doing that. So why not reopen? I, I think right. it's great, and you a see, lot of my, people are you ready. See, I'm, you see, I'm going to play the... Um, uh, I'm going to play the uh, devil's mouthpiece for a second. Yeah. So I can understand the six feet social distancing at beaches, but what about pools? How do you separate, if you're inside of a pool, how do you separate people to be six feet apart? Yeah. So what are you going to do? Just sit in a corner? Right. Maybe like every, like they could have like a specifically the, uh, not so much the water. Cause I think that's the difficult part is when you're in the water, you're going to be around other people. Right. But like outside of the pool, when you're sitting in a lawn chair, right. you so could do you like see, every other chair. So you see, that to me is a gray area. And yeah. I don't know if there's guidance listed from the state on that or what. Right. But to me, that just sounds like a gray area that, okay, so if you're at a pool place, let's say they have a deck or whatever, right. the beach chairs have to be spread out six right. feet. But when you're in the pool, do you have to be away from others? I guess if you're with your own family unit. Right. Right? But That's still. That's my thought. Right. But still, if I'm going to crouch myself into a corner, I might as well just get into a hot tub. <laughs> because <laughs> That's it's just like the point of a pool is to swim yeah. around, have fun, play with the beach toys yeah. and whatnot, like the bouncy, like the bouncy ball. Right. Right. And, whatnot. and, and, and interact with others, which I think we've been almost... Right. For the last year, everyone's been so afraid to do that. And now that we do have increased vaccinations, right. and, and I think at the end of the day, a lot of people know how to deal with COVID, right? We, mm. we know about the mask wearing, and, and it all comes down to uh, my two cents here, which I don't really like to give too much on the news, but I think it comes down to common sense, right? Is if we're doing the right things and everybody agrees in a group, that's what we've, we've done for a long time, like especially the outdoor gatherings now. You can right. gather with people and be separated and be safe. Mm -hmm. You know, just use the noodle. I guess we'll just see what happens here. It's uh, good to see Joseph. He says it's what uh, they've done at the YMCA for a long time. Yeah, uh, Sue, she says good grief. Yeah, good grief, Charlie Brown. 
I think a lot of people are ready to reopen, that's for sure. Well, that's going to do it for us today. News 24-7 at WNYNewsNow.com. We're back tomorrow with our TGIF edition. Hope to see you then. In the meantime, download our mobile app to stay in the know when you're on the go.